Tony had this saying that everyone who is on TV is desperately afraid of not being on TV. This is Tom Vitale. He's the longtime producer and director working alongside one of the boldest, most rock star men ever, Anthony Bourdain. Over the 12 years he traveled with Bourdain, hitting more countries than you can know, they told stories about food, culture, and ultimately about what makes us human. According to Vitaly, life was never dull on the job and his amazing career came to a sudden halt in June 2018 when Bourdain passed away. In Vitaly's book, In the Weeds, and in the conversation we have here on the podcast, he shares behind the scenes stories and reveals the true nature of Bourdain off camera. There are few places on earth more beautiful. But there we are sitting and what are they? It was like a Godfather theme park. Oh, look, Michael Corleone got married there. Oh, it's so fantastic. Because ultimately the show went on until Tony's death. Why continue to do something so challenging, so difficult, required so much of you? Why continue to do that for another few years if you felt over it or burnt out? It was just not the sort of job that you could or would leave. Life was never dull. Nothing with Tony was ever dull. So we start to look for that scene. This boxing place on the outskirts of the city where all these old men beat each other to a bloody pulp while all the audience eat pasta. It's like the ancient Roman gladiators. Tony was pretty brilliant. He played the game like he didn't care. And whatever the network said, we were gonna do the opposite. Whatever it was they wanted, we just had to do the opposite. How is it that this man was a bigger personality than even made it onto tape? Well, I mean, that was that was Tony. He was much bigger than life. And definitely what made it to air was, in a lot of ways, a kind of watered down version of what the experience was like, but partially because we weren't always chasing, you know, the most extreme or dramatic thing that was low hanging fruit, as Tony would call it. I think what went on behind the scenes and, and, and Tony off camera was was a lot bigger than than the Tony that, that was on screen. And is that because he felt the need to be censored because it's for broadcast and television? Is that the need to be a professional? Was it that he was afraid to reveal too much or were you guys really good at filtering things out in post? <laughs> well, he was always a very good guest. So, you know, if he was sitting down across the table from somebody, he was going to be a bit more behaved. So it was more the kind of stuff that would go on between takes. I mean, there were a lot of things, uh, maybe some more emotional moments too, that, you know, once we got into the edit, he would uh, say, no, we don't need to use that or you're, you're beating that drum too hard. Like, like why? Um, I don't know, like if he was really emotional about revisiting somebody in Vietnam that he had seen 10 or 15 years ago who'd passed away. I remember we had an edit in um, Saigon many years ago and somebody from a cook's tour who he was very close with had passed away, this woman he called Mom Gao. And he had this very sort of emotional return and we ended the show with him visiting her grave and then he sat outside afterwards and and he didn't quite cry but it was you know sort of very emotional and he said some really kind of powerful things to the camera so i got into the edit and of course wanted to use those because you know it was pretty emotional and i know cut it all out cut it all out it's it's way too way too dramatic emotional you know leave the show in a more open-ended way do you think it was a better episode by cutting all that stuff? Or do you think it would have been better to leave your director's cut? <laughs> I think he was absolutely right. Looking back oh, at really? it this many years later. Yeah, I think less is kind of always more. I know there were a lot of battles we would have through the edit. And as I've thought back about a, a fair amount of them, I realize you know, he was right. Yeah, I think he had a very good sense of that sort of thing, especially about the way that he came off. He was very kind of involved in, in all of that in the edit. And do you think he had this innate ability or this innate sense to know where the story was or where the interesting point was? And for people who aren't in television, they may not just be aware of just like the hundreds of hours of of tape that you might go through to cut down to like a 44 minute episode of something. And so you really get to cherry pick the moments and you get to also move things out of order if you want. And you get to come back later and script stuff in a voiceover if you want to change the context. So like, so you're almost going out into the world capturing whatever you can capture and then later kind of deciding the best story to tell with what you have to work with. But do you think in the moment he had this innate ability of kind of zeroing in on what mattered most? I don't know. In in some ways, yes. In in some ways, no. He was very aware. But I think a lot of the times that we'd have ideas about something in the field, they often turned out to be wrong. It wasn't until we got back into the edit. I remember uh, the way that we edited the shows was a little bit ass backwards, sort of, 
we kind of had to cut a version of the show that was the best way I kind of saw it or the editor and I would work together to do that. And then we'd have to present it to Tony with no voiceover. And then you would have to write voiceover to that. But that was his sort of first take, you know, first look at a cut. And oftentimes the feedback was you got it all wrong. And so in order to prevent this huge amount of but, time. But did you have it all wrong or is just not what he was feeling? Well, whatever he was feeling ended up being right. I mean, it was kind of <laughs> one of those situations. Like, I don't know if there's objectively actually a right or a wrong way to do things. You know, if he was happy, that emotion, that energy, you know, it all kind of worked. I mean, who knows what was wrong or right? Obviously, something was right because people apparently watch the show and you're interested in talking to me all these years later. You know, he was a character that was larger than life. I mean, the, the first time that you met him, what, you're, you're a junior, you're an assistant editor, you're a tape logger, you're supposed to go deliver something and he throws you out of his office or something? <laughs> I was uh, to, his, to his house. I had to deliver a VHS tape of the rough cut of an episode that puts a bit of a date on it. We used to make VHS tapes and they would get sent to his apartment when he was in New York to look at it. and. For whatever reason, somebody wasn't able to do that. So I had the opportunity to take the tape to him that day. And I'd been logging the footage. And you know, you kind of feel like you know Tony even when you hadn't met him just by seeing him on camera. For some reason, he had that kind of gift. So I felt like I knew him. And I spent the whole taxi ride trying to work out something you know, intelligent to say to him. And I got there. And I got up to his apartment and knocked on the door. And I held up the tape. And... He took it from my hand and the door slammed in my face before I even got to say anything. So that was my first meeting with him. It was somewhat inauspicious. And how does one go from being, you know, an assistant editor to years later being a producer, being a director, traveling the world with him? How did that journey work for you? Well, it was a really small company and small group of people who made the show. We'd started off at New York Times for a Cook's tour. And then when No Reservations got off the ground, we kind of, a bunch of us got back together again. And Chris and Lydia, who ran the company, it was a very, very sort of informal environment. And I'd go into their office every Friday and remind them almost as a joke how much I wanted to travel with the show. Because at this point, I'd spent a couple of years logging the footage and then worked as a post producer with the editors on the footage that would come back because they were field producers. And then I would handle it in the edit. And I think just to sort of shut me up, they, they gave me a chance. And so I went on this trip to Moscow with Tony. And despite a few unfortunate things happening, including um, what's called a double punch, it, this wasn't my fault, fortunately, but Tony went up in a fighter jet, this $10,000 sort of once in a lifetime Russian, like, supersonic jet and the dp double punched and it didn't get recorded the double tap the double tap <laughs> the double right tap. they exactly. hit record and then accidentally hit again and then all you see is feet with people walking around right <laughs> literally so I, I think you've been there unfortunately I, i'm i'm sorry yeah it's, i own a production uh, company awful thing. <laughs> i've done it myself <laughs> so tony landed from the jet uh, got out of the jet and said that was the most incredible experience of my life like play back the tape which is the one and only time Ever and, and all you see is probably the DP like adjusting the camera and being like, okay, literally a terrible Let me, let me look just hit record now. Face. And Tony, meanwhile, rushing, all right, come on, come on, numb nuts, like, uh, you know, hurry up, hurry up and get that going. You know, we're wasting time. So I think Tony had, uh, you know, freaked him out a bit. But despite that setback, the show went well because we got along. And then all of a sudden, I was on the roster for traveling and it was kind of a nonstop run from then till 2018. And how do you become director? That happened pretty quickly, actually. Um, kind of timing was sort of part of it. I was there and I didn't fuck up too bad. I mean, that was, for me at least, obviously the, the job that I wanted. Didn't have to worry about the logistics as much anymore. Had someone else for that. And either through obstinance or stupidity or lack of knowledge or whatever it was, I would just kind of prod Tony. He called it stove piping, where I'd keep, you know, asking him the sort of standard things like to keep talking for the camera. As much as he hated doing that, it was kind of a pretty good relationship because, you know, I was the only one, again, stupid enough to keep asking him to talk to the camera even when he clearly didn't want to. And we got some great stuff in those, uh, in those takes. And so what, you know, when you're 
producing a show at this level? And I know that as you move through the different TV shows and you move from what I guess Travel Channel to CNN Mm -hmm. and you move, you know, through no reservations and then parts unknown as the production budgets go up, as the crew gets larger, as, as the countries you're traveling into become more complex, as everything gets harder, I'm sure it changed. But what does a director do and what made you, other than being willing to ask Tony questions that that pissed him off, what made you qualified to do this? Oh, well, that's a really good question. Because I don't know what a director doesn't do in some senses. I mean, it's everything from, you know, understanding the creative sort of vision or direction of the episode, or at least where you think it's going, to coordinating all the different crew members and that big kind of cultural gap there'd often be between our objectives and wherever it was we were landing. There's definitely a lot of diplomacy involved with that, making sure everyone's having a good time. I thought that was kind of, in a certain way, a pretty vital part of the mix. I think that that kind of energy was um, it's sort of like, uh, it's contagious. If we weren't having a good time making the show, then that would come through in the edit no matter how much spit and polish you could put on something. You could still sort of tell. So when everyone's having a good time and inspired and engaged and things go really well, so it's a little bit like a cruise director there to, <laughs> to mix in with it. We would often find ourselves in uh, what we called international incidents where you know something would go wrong and it would be horribly embarrassing or potentially you know awkward or difficult. Tony's deadly? Um, ever deadly. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, just getting in a car is the most dangerous thing any of us will ever do. And so when you are filming, especially internationally and rushing around, I thought the transport was always pretty dangerous. In fact, I think you're kind of more dangerous just in a car in Paris filming in a regular car on a shoot than you are filming, you know, in Congo or Libya. When you're in a more dangerous place, you have you know, more support for that kind of thing. We'd travel with a medic, you know, and a team of security guys when we went to more dangerous places. But yeah, lots of lots of uh, dangerous things all the time, certainly. It's amazing that we didn't have more injuries. Um, I was not on this shoot, but I think the closest story I know that we ever came to was uh, we were filming in Brazil and there was this helicopter Right, because I think really wealthy people get around from skyscraper to skyscraper by helicopter in Sao Paulo. Yeah, to avoid the and, kidnapping, right? And the traffic. I don't know which is worse. Oh, and the traffic. Okay. I just assumed it was, you know, <laughs> all of the kidnappings, but okay. <laughs> and the DP had forgot to connect his harness. And so, you know, they take off and the doors open and he went to go lean to get a shot up there thinking he was harnessed in. This is you know, some thousands of feet over the city and he wasn't. And uh, so the, the field producer, Tracy, she caught his belt just in time. I mean, short of the fact that we were, you know, sort of living underneath the sort of Damocles for every, uh, every moment we were filming. That's one of the, the bigger missed dangers. And so in, in the book promo, I read something interesting, which is you're the only crew member to not have an NDA signed. And so I imagine that has to do with the fact that this book, your new book that came out last year in the weeds is like really revealing, but I'm more curious, why the hell didn't you, why didn't, why are you the only one without an NDA? (laughs) Well, you know, we'd started making the show sort of a small group of people and there never were any NDAs. And then at some point midway through the CNN production, we had a new production manager who came on and I think she... I guess very smartly and wisely realized, oh my gosh, there's no NDAs and all this start paperwork. I mean, that's a pretty normal thing that would, you know, happen as you start a new job. But pretty much everyone who'd been working on the show had been working on it for a very long time. And so that wasn't really a part of anything that existed. And so they started this campaign to get everyone to sign the NDAs. I don't know. I think at that point, working on the production, this is maybe about 2016 or 17. So pretty close to the end. I was feeling pretty paranoid and um, I don't know, it was like, uh, you know, working with Tony, there was this field crew and then there was like the office people were different and then the network was something else and they were basically all the enemy according to the way Tony set things up. So I just refused to sign the paperwork and then they said they were going to stop giving me paychecks if I didn't sign the NDA. And so I figured that was pretty much 
the end of it. And I mean, for, for a while, for the last couple of years, believe it or not, even though it was kind of the best job in the world, I felt like I needed an escape from it. So I thought this would just be a way of letting the universe take care of that. But then I don't know, they got into Tony got into some fight with a production company and all of a sudden they it, completely unrelated to the NDAs. And then they totally backed off about asking for anything. So it kind of just slipped through the cracks. Tell me about that, you know, 16, 17, 18, because ultimately the show went on until Tony's death. And even after a little bit, we had to complete a few episodes to fulfill the contract. But yeah, wrapped up in 20. Uh, like that must have been a, a, a huge challenging period. But why continue to do something that was so hard, so challenging, so difficult, required so much of you? Why continue to do that for another few years if you felt over it or burnt out? I think that as much as it was like overwhelming or maybe feel burned out, it was also the most amazing, wonderful, you know, I don't, nobody, maybe there's one person in the entire history of all the different incarnations of the show who actually left willingly. And that was for a pretty good job high up in a network. It was just not the sort of job that you could or would leave. And I think I knew also that even if I actually had quit or something, Tony probably would have done something very magnanimous to try to bring me back. So there wasn't really a way out. Did you feel trapped and this is a bad thing? Or I'm, I'm trying to understand because I, I've heard you say that only one person's ever left over this time. It was a really tight crew. It was a really small crew. It must have been a tremendous amount of trust and rhythm built. And, but there must have been something else keeping you all there. I mean, Tony was an, an incredibly magnetic person. What was um, it about him? Personality. Well, life was never dull. Nothing <laughs> with Tony was ever dull. Even the boring in between moments of his little commentary, he could talk about some, run a line at an airport somewhere. He could, you know, poke some fun at some other passengers or a crew member or something that had happened. And I mean, it was just high comedy. He definitely always kept everyone very, very entertained, even if it could be, you know, some pretty dark humor at times. Humor, uh, laughing was a big part of it. I think even when things got really, really hard or awful, there was always, you know, a joke to be had. I'm curious because I think that for anyone who wants to become their own version of the next, you know, Anthony Bourdain, the person who's in the spotlight, the person who has the big vision, the person who's who's that magnetic center. I think some of us realize that there's just a lot of work and a lot of people behind the scenes to make things happen. I think often of, uh, you know, the three guys from Top Gear. People think that, you know, Jeremy Clarkson and, you know, Richard Hammond and, you know, James May are all really great guys and they're really great personalities. But when these crews are traveling, they bring like 120 people with them and they have massive budgets. Now, I'm not saying you guys were that big of a crew, but there's just a lot of people working to make that person shine in that moment. And I think a lot of people listening right now want their own version of that. They want their team to help them. They want the confidence to be able to step up. But but Anthony was a pretty demanding person. And I'm curious, one, what you learned by working for someone with such high standards who's so demanding. And what are the lessons that we, or the things that we can emulate, and what are the things that we should probably not <laughs> copy? Well, Tony had this saying that everyone who is on TV is desperately afraid of not being on TV. Mm. And I think that that is incredibly true. Working in TV is a fantastic thing if that's what you want. And so the thought of you know getting kicked out of that bubble or not working in TV is very terrifying, especially if you're on camera, it's even worse. And although I think he definitely did want to be on TV, he played the game like he didn't care and made all of these very sort of risky moves. Like, um, for instance, back before he was really famous, I mean, he was a little bit famous, but the Food Network wanted to shift a cook's tour from an international travel show to a barbecue-centric series. And rather than um, do that, something he didn't want to do, Tony said, fuck it, and walked away. And for all intents and purposes, you know, that could have been the end for him when it came to TV. But because he made risky moves and 
stayed true to himself, decided he'd rather not be on TV than make a show he didn't want to make, you know, it kind of worked out. It's a very risky sort of game because probably for most people who take that gamble, they'd wind up off TV. So I don't know if it's quite a business model, but it worked for Tony and it's kind of the um, ethic that he instilled in all of us. Um, you know, take that NDA as an example that you brought up before any sane person would have just signed the damn NDA. I mean, I had no thought I'd ever write a book. It wasn't about the fact that there was something I wanted to say. I just, the office was the main reason I didn't want to sign the NDA. And, you know, a lot of what we did was just, I mean, whatever the network said, we were going to do the opposite. Whatever it was they wanted, we just had to do the opposite. By the time we got to CNN, there was less of that because they kind of just wanted the show that already existed. But much of, I think, what the show became was sort of in reaction to whatever it was that the executives at Travel Channel wanted. So I don't know if that's good advice for um, <laughs> for anyone who's looking to build their career, because it'll probably just lead right to uh, living in a cardboard box. But that's kind of what we did, and it worked. Uh, do, do you think so? Of- do, you, do, you, do you see, like, so he had this bold, rebellious spirit that people really admired. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, I think I, I'm hearing that that came through and even the way he operated the crew and the television show and everything else and it's like The Office. So there's this bold, brash, rebellious spirit. Have you seen others try that and it just doesn't work because you're saying, hey, that's not career advice. And yet, I don't know, it seemed, it seemed to have worked in this case. That wasn't just luck. Well, it, it worked in this case. I, I think that's because, you know, the product and Tony was really good. And I think if he wasn't so good, he, along with the rest of us, would have been unceremoniously tossed to the curve long, long ago. You know, networks and production companies don't like to put up with that kind of bullshit, I guess, unless they absolutely have to, which is part of the weirdness of the office dynamic because, uh, you know, the show was very successful and doing well and Tony was happy. So you can't really rock that boat too much. It worked. I, I haven't worked that many other places, but based on what I understand from Tony and combined with just common sense, clearly most people do not run their operations that way. And having worked for as long as you have on the team, you just mentioned I I haven't worked that many places. So you spent 12 years traveling with him, 16 years working with the company. You know, at the end, when he passed away and you're mid-production and you still have to wrap up some episodes, I've heard you say that, you know, your entire identity, your entire career... Tony was the center of our universe. You know, I think of a song from one of my favorite groups, Ben Folds Five. They put out this kind of quiet album a few years ago, but there's this song, I think it's called After Frank. But the lyrics of the song, which I find really interesting, are this idea that it's this person who works with Frank Sinatra for his whole life. And he is the person behind the scenes. And he talks about how every time he walked into a room, people would see him, but then look just past him to see if Frank was walking in. And how people would hold the door open and greet him and do all of these things. But then when Frank Sinatra passes away, how much things change. How he's dedicated his whole life to this character that people look to and and his career. And yet when he's gone, who am I? And as I was going through your story and I was thinking of these things, I was just thinking of the similarities between the song by Ben Folds Five, you know, where it's like after the man who lights up the room and is the center of the universe is gone, what do we all do next? How do you work through that? How do you, what, what do you do next? Well, it's a, it's a good question. Um, part of that for me was writing the book. I mean, a huge part. It was a couple years, you know, after Tony died when I started that. After I finished the shows, I went to Italy for a couple months, figuring I'd just work some stuff out of my system. And then I'd come back and figure out sort of what was next. And, you know, I came back and I couldn't figure out what was next. Couldn't really sort of move on. Um, But you must be like from a career point of view, and and maybe this is a different, maybe we're talking about two different things, but you just come off the show. You just come off of all this work. You must be in demand. You must be someone who should be able to walk into any doc-based television series, show company, production company, and, and have the ability to do anything you want. No? Probably, uh, you know, the, the conversations I had were a lot about, well, we want to do the Anthony Bourdain of 
this of that and that was kind of a very distasteful thought it's still difficult so i wasn't very interested in that it would um not feel like the right thing to do to just do that again but with somebody else it'd be like some you know alternate version of reality where i'm there going the same motions again except it's not tony that i'm doing it with and i feel like it would have been a constant reminder i mean not that a lot of other things aren't a constant reminder but um that would have been very difficult so there's two years between you writing the book and his passing what what did you do in that time i drank a lot okay <sighs> caught up on my sleep um not that much crying surprisingly it took many more years before I could get back in touch with my emotions. Yeah, I did nothing. Just kind of waiting to burn out whatever energy I couldn't move beyond, but it just sort of wasn't really happening. And you didn't have to worry about money or anything? You'd, you'd, you'd made enough doing, doing the career? I certainly had some, some money saved up, but I don't even know. I mean, a lot of emotions wrapped up in all of it, even the kind of thought of going back to work in TV. So I know I've always sort of done things because they feel right and I'm really passionate about them. And um, yeah, just kind of feeling my way through things. And so I think that the, the book was sort of the only thing I could, uh, or I was that interested or passionate about. And where did the idea come from? Because you've never written a book before. and I've never uh, <laughs> written a book before. Most people don't go like... I mean, everybody in the back of their mind has a book in them. But thinking and dreaming and saying, I'm an author or I'm a writer, and then sitting down and writing a book. But oh my gosh, it was so hard. Oh, two totally different <laughs> things. And uh, I, I say that having been someone who's never written a book myself. <laughs> but where did the idea come from? Well... I'd always sort of joked that I should write a book because, you know, we'd done so many interesting things with the, with the show, but that was never really very serious. But it was a, a friend's daughter's birthday party a couple of years later, and I um, met uh, an old friend of mine who is a writer, and we were just talking. She asked kind of a, a similar question about whatever it was I was going to do next when I didn't have a good answer, and um, she would suggested well, you should write a book about it. And so I started doing a little bit of writing and um, it came really easily at first. And so I showed that to her and she thought it was really good. And she connected me with an agent that she knew and they liked it and they helped me put together this sort of book proposal. Then that all just kind of happened really quickly and I got a book deal and then I actually had to write the damn thing I don't know how many months it was. I sat there just like unable to write or procrastinating. I got a lot of other stuff done that I had uh, a lot of deferred maintenance um, until I was really freaking out because I was just running out of time to write the damn thing. And then finally it all started to come and happen really fast. And I got maybe about 10 or 15% of the way through the book when all of a sudden my time was up. And so that's what it is. Just a small little sliver of, of what it was like, but I think hopefully it gives sort of a, a sense as much as is humanly possible or can be captured in a book at least what it was like to be there. Well, I mean, I, I think that one of the best places to try and find out both the pros and cons or the good points and bad points of any book is to just look at a few reviews. And, you know, one, well, two stood out at me uh, in particular, but one suggests that this gives a whole picture. The good, the bad, the complicated, the insanity, the willfulness, the paranoia, the love of life, the fear of the unknown. That was what one person wrote uh, about, about the book. And then there are a few people who perhaps suggest that you're just trying to like, jump on the money train, right? I worked with this guy, something bad happened to him. I'm going to go ahead and try and make a lot of money and make myself super special. And I don't know. How do you deal with those kind of criticisms? I don't care. I definitely was not trying to jump on any money train. 
I could have done that a lot differently. I didn't have too much time to think about any of those things when I was writing the book. And I haven't thought too much about it afterwards, but I haven't read that review. Uh, but that's not too you much. Do you read reviews or no? Like some people say, do not do that. But no, I've, I say I've that, but, but, but keep in mind, you have, reviews. you have like a thousand, you have a thousand global reviews and, and it's got like 4.8 stars. So it's not like I, I, you have to work hard. I'm a bit like Fox News right now where I'm, <laughs> where I'm being like, there's this side and this side. But the positive has like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of views. I had to work hard to find uh, some negative ones to figure out what people are complaining about here. I did remember reading one review on Amazon that um, the complaint was that it, it sounded like a Animal House or something like that, yes. like a frat. <laughs> yeah, frat, frat, Animal House. A big compliment. Did you? I did. The criticism that I'd be doing on it, or doing writing the book to sort of exploit Tony's memory would be a harder, a harder one. But I didn't make that much money from the book. Um, you know, you're the first person I've talked to in a year or two. I'm certainly not out, uh, you know, beating, beating the uh, the drum. So I. It's still super weird for me that anyone has even kind of read the book. And why, and why is that? I mean, you, you wrote a book knowing people have interests, knowing people would want to... I mean, I can understand the, the sensitivity because you are super vulnerable in it. But is it just because, frankly, the things that made you so good at working behind the scenes means that you're kind of built for staying behind the scenes? <laughs> it's definitely a much more comfortable place to be behind the scenes. There's no question about that. If I'd had more time to kind of process and think through what it actually meant and that I was going to have to be vulnerable and put myself into the book as opposed to just write about a bunch of the stuff that we did. I don't know if I would have done it. Uh, so fortunately, I, I kind of didn't really have time to think about those things. <laughs> I love it. I I, th I think it's that rebellious spirit and that, that, that was kind of ingrained into you. You know, they talk about the school of, of hard knocks, the school of life. I mean, you went through, let's see, you were there 12 years. So you have like two, three master degrees and a PhD in, uh, <laughs> in rebellious, bold action, it sounds like. <laughs> and snarkology. <laughs> snarkology. I love it. I, I want to get a little bit to the craft because I would be like super remiss if, you know, you guys have done thousands of hours of trips and all of this work. I'm curious, like if I get an episode and I admitted to you before we recorded that that I've not seen all of the shows, I've not been a super fan for like a decade. And part of me wishes that that I was, but for example, I picked out an episode of Parts Unknown where you guys go to Italy. What I found so interesting and curious about it is it's like, let's talk about Mussolini. Let's talk about fascism. Let's talk about a spirit of people who are just willing to be like, Fuck you, and let's focus on music that's about death and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, this is so weird, right? Like, and, and the question I have from an editorial point of view or a directing point of view, or even a how we make this show point of view is how do we, out of all the stories we can tell because food and travel and people and culture and history seems to be the threads that hold what you guys did together. But out of everything that you could talk about and all the stories you could talk about, why, why pick that? Like, why is that the thing that we want to center a story on? And that's just one story of one episode from, from the hundreds of things you guys did. Tony was, was pretty brilliant um, in a lot of ways. Much of that particular storyline was directly from him before we started filming. I remember we were in Buenos Aires at the time. I was still trying to figure out that show, plus another one in the edit. And we had the shoot with President Obama coming up not too far in the future. And he was just going on and on about this Italy show. And I remember being completely overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so just for the audience, I, like just, just let's park here for a moment. You just said, I was in Buenos Aires. And uh, we have the Obama shoot coming up, and we ha and I'm in post on this other thing, and Anthony's talking about Italy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> this that was, was your I life mean, there for was, years, right? Everything overlapped. Um, each year in August, maybe there was a week when there were only two shows in production, two episodes. So it was always nonstop. Ultimately, ended up being a fantastic episode, and was really very brilliant and inspired. He. Um, especially in later years, always had a very specific 
idea about a place and where we were going and what story he wanted to tell. A lot of those places, you know, we'd been to many times before. So you kind of had a sense of um, what it was he wanted to say. I mean, so at that point in 2016, when we did that Rome episode, Trump, I can't remember if he was the candidate yet, but he, he, he was like out there, but I think nobody thought he'd actually be president. Tony had this idea that fascism was on the rise and he thought that Mussolini and Trump looked really similar. Uh, we actually found in the archival footage, this quote from Mussolini talking about making Italy great again, which was kind of amazing. But yeah, he just, he had that idea and, um, which it started off with, let's do Rome without any of the monuments, which is, you know, kind of an idea that had existed before, like go to Paris and don't film the Eiffel Tower or, you know, Washington DC and don't show any monuments. So subcultures was also a big part of what Tony liked to do. So, you know, like uh, film in Los Angeles, but uh, only with the Latino community, something like that. And so this episode was going to be about the, uh, the suburbs of Rome, everyday Romans. Was it um, curiosity? Was it boredom? Like, was it just this desperate need to not do what's expected? Like, what, what would, would have driven this episode after episode, story arc after story arc, story after story? Because it's either incredibly energizing and inspiring to never do the same thing ever twice or it's very taxing to never have to do the same thing <laughs> twice and continually to one-up yourself. Well, it's, it's all of the above, definitely. Um, you know, and it must have been incredibly taxing for Tony, too. Uh, he always had to be interested and stimulated in something, and he had a very short attention span. So if it was even close to something we'd done before or anyone had done before, that at least he knew of, it was uh, definitely a no-go. But... He might have had some, you know, good ideas, but the actualization of them was uh, was up to the crew, and that could be very challenging. I, p- part of that Italy episode was to shoot the entire thing anamorphically, which, you know, we could have just done a nice letterbox on our regular cameras, and but yeah, anamorphic is the wider aspect ratio. Yeah, two, three, five. So that's that wide screen, not sixteen yeah. by nine, and not four by three, because you and I are old, but. <laughs> Even wider, even wider. Yeah, exactly. And um, so in order to do that, we needed to film with these actual anamorphic lenses and cameras that were huge, these huge, huge cameras. And, you know, we have no scripts. These are all real people interacting with the show. And so one of the ways that we're able to capture stuff normally is with kind of lighter cameras and more mobility. Gosh, with this episode, we had to have these box trucks and all of you know huge Italian local crew focus pullers like to make all this equipment work. And we'd never really and then, and then data management because now suddenly you're you're shooting like yeah, well, there was, huge there was amounts whole, of cards and, and and data and all this stuff, right? Yeah, we had a DIT downloading everything um, in a van somewhere while we were filming. And I was just terrified it wasn't going to work out because i mean we couldn't even pivot the cameras very easily or quickly let alone take them anywhere but miraculously as things often did and rome is just such an amazing city the magic sort of found its way in in front of our lens somehow and i'm watching i'm watching the episode head over to youtube and you can take a look at it i'm watching the episode and there's this like whole scene at a boxing ring that also has spaghetti dinners and I'm just like, I'm like, what is going on? And I'm thinking of all the waivers you got to get people, all the releases you got to get signed for, for potentially all the people or, or you know, and, um, and sound. And typically when you would film something, you'd have everyone hit marks. You'd have stuff measured out with tape measures. You'd have focus pullers know how to pull focus. And you'd say, okay, let's go through it again. Let's go through it again. Let's go through it again. You'd block everything out. You know where everything's going to happen for camera. And then you would do shot, scene after scene after scene, shot after shot. And then you would reset everything to grab alternate angles. But instead, you have these people boxing in real time. You have the crowds. You have spaghetti dinners being eaten. I'm just thinking, this is, you know, as someone, again, who owns a production company, this is bananas. Like, I don't even know why. Like, it's, 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 a, 
And, and the guest even says, this is ludicrous. Like, she goes, this is a pretty ludicrous uh, thing that's happening right now. How do, how do you guys find this or come up with this? Or is it just so bizarre? You're like, I love it. Well, the irony, well, the, I mean, that story, uh, the, that location was just like almost, um, almost created for us, which actually it was. It's kind of a, a long story, but it was, it was her idea, the guest there, Asia, and um, she had talked about this, this boxing place on the outskirts of the city where all these old men beat each other to a bloody pope while all the audience watches pasta. It's like the ancient Roman gladiators. And um, so we start to look for that scene, you know, in pre-production in the place and we get, you know, connected with all these people. Like it turns out it may or may not really exist. So we had to sort of recreate it there based on ah, what she was saying, because it, it kind it was of a close happened. set. Well, it was not a close set. No, all those people, they were, that was a real match. The only thing that was altered was that we served pasta because they weren't serving pasta. And we're actually, I mean, if I was going to a boxing match and all of a sudden there was a film crew there and somebody, you know, shoved a plate of pasta in my face, I don't think I would eat it. But anyway, all the people did and they were really good sports. And so after the scene, I filmed for about three hours, two hours, maybe with, with Tony there. Then Tony left and we had to get the food inserts. And um, so we would reset. Then this is pretty you know, common to get food inserts to make the food later, or get the food close ups of the food after Tony leaves. And so often I or another member of the crew would sit in to do that. And um, so I sit in to do the twirling pasta on my fork. And I hadn't eaten in two days is, you know, when you're um, even when making a food show as a director, you probably don't end up eating very much because the food's not uh, as appealing. You said you lose like 15 pounds an episode out of stress. About 10 pounds each trip, yeah. And, um, but I thought I was starving, and I'm not the most adventurous eater, but you know, pasta and red sauce would be a pretty easy thing to eat. And so I'm twirling the pasta, and they're fighting in the background. And Todd asked me to pause for a second as I'm getting the food inserts. So I have the, you know, the fork here. My mouth is kind of open. And one of the boxers gets like sucked really hard. And this long ropey thread of like saliva mixed with sweat <laughs> flew into my mouth. Cause I had my mouth open <laughs> at the thing like this. I had to run outside and throw up. <sighs> Fortunately, not many people saw that. But <laughs> that is, um, that's yeah. okay. So, so here's the, a question the I have for of the you. show is, is actually my hand twirling the pasta right before I throw up everywhere. Perfect. Perfect. So, so I would like to know your relationship with fear because uh, you're petrified of flying and yet you've traveled all around the world. I know you don't like, I don't know if this matters or not. I know you don't like fish, but, but anyway, that's just, that's just research that came back to me. But, but you sound a phobia, a phobia of fish, um, but you know, an incredibly anxious, it sounds like, uh, wound up, nervous. There's a ton of pressure on you all the time. How have you grown? How what has your relationship with fear been like? How how do you do stuff even though, frankly, you don't want to? How have you been able to mature? And what lessons have you learned as as it relates to fear? Yeah, well, I don't know. I think cameras make people do really stupid things, um, including forget all of your fears, because I guess maybe my fear of up or not getting the shot of the show was bigger than my fear of um, whatever it was that I had to do. I mean, some of the airplanes and helicopters <laughs> that I've been on over the years, oh, it's terrifying. But, you know, oftentimes um, something like that, I'd, I'd be holding a third camera and it's amazing. You can just kind of like look into the viewfinder down the barrel of the lens and sort of feels like you're not really there. Uh, like you're That's watching kind a preview of, monitor and it's kind of like detached. Yeah, there's a there's a detachment that way. That um, sort of helped. I remember I used to get that question a lot more when I first started traveling because everyone knew how scared I was of flying, for instance. And um, I remember back then that I used to say that I'd never let sort of fear get in the way of, you know, an amazing opportunity or experience. So yeah, I guess that my kind of desire to do whatever that thing was or be a part of that outweighed the fear. I mean, if, if those things weren't 
scary in a, in a certain way, it would have been a lot less interesting. For a lot of the crew, kind of dealing with uh, phobias and fears, you know, on a regular basis was sort of part of it. I mean, Tony was pretty shy and um, germaphobic even. So I know that there's a lot of the stuff that he'd be eating that he wasn't very happy about eating. Um, but you, know, you never let it sort of get in the way. It's like a, a little bit like reality, you know, not letting it get in the way of doing something fun or stupid. Consequences be damned. For every project that I've ever been a part of that I'm really proud of, there's that one guiding principle, you know, and people call it all kinds of different things. North Star and all these things. So, you know, with, with my team, when we boil everything down at the end of the day, it's like, just make people look good. That's kind of our thing, right? Like, like if we make people look good, everything else will take care of itself. As you guys were putting these shows together, did you have, did you have that one thing that it would always come back to? Was it about entertainment or storytelling or adventure? Well, I think we all or... did. It, it was um, making Tony happy. Making Tony happy. Mm-hmm. And you didn't was... mind working in that situation? <laughs> what do you mean? Um, I want to surround myself with, as an entrepreneur, I want to surround myself with people who have the same passions I have, the same mission I have, and want to make me happy. It makes me feel incredibly uncomfortable, though. It makes me feel hypocritical and selfish and self-centered and all these things. And I want to serve others. But there comes a point where it becomes a little bit unhealthy. And and from some of the stories, it sounds like sometimes it was healthy and sometimes it wasn't. So you, you spent all these years doing that and doing this work. And I guess... Um, you were okay with it. I mean, I, I would challenge anyone to spend any amount of time around Tony and not somehow kind of get sucked into that vortex of uh, wanting to, you know, please him. I mean, you know, w- when you're around somebody with such a clear vision like that, um, it's a very powerful thing. Uh, you know, and so, it, what was that vision? I, so, so you were all there to help serve the, the Tony and make him happy, and he had this drive and desire. What was that vision he had? Whatever he wanted, he just did with such conviction. Hmm. Uh, I mean, it, it could have been as simple as pranking a crew member. Uh, I remember the time you know he brought a very realistic fake rat to Madagascar because there was a bubonic plague outbreak. Um, you know, and placing that dead rat perfectly was very important to him. There were, you know, times when whatever it was that he was interested in was more important than the scene. You know, he could like scuttle or throw a whole scene just to, just to prove a point. I mean, ultimately nine times out of 10, it was making a good show. I mean, I think 10 times out of 10 really, because it was all about that. And that good show is whatever he found interesting. You know, th- th- there wasn't, really a mission like to you know cure hunger yeah there was no mission it was kind of a pretty self-indulgent you know enterprise basically to kind of have a good time i think what people so admire and like is it's almost like rock and roll you know like like you're making something, you're creating something, an environment, an experience, you're sharing a story, you're making connections. There's not really always a framework or a structure or an ABC to how it comes together, but it kind of when it feels right, it feels right. And when you have something to say or are influenced by outside forces, you kind of roll with it. I think what I so admire is just the uh, the courage and the the dedication and I'll go back to the rebellious, bold, brash spirit of of being like, this is what I want to say. And then, and then saying that, you know, um, I've heard you describe the fact that, you know, you guys used to try and figure out how many swear words can you get into an episode and, you know, how far can we push things and, and how far can we go, you know, going 50% more (laughs) like, Hey, we know that the lawyers and and regulatory and, and what standards are going to help are never going to let us do this stuff. So let's go ahead and just drop a bunch of shit in that, that we know will never get approved just so we can do this other stuff on the other end. That's way cooler. And, um, I guess I'm, I'm looking to try and dissect something that really just comes down to art and vibe and, and a creator creating whatever really intrigued him maybe in the moment. 
you know, he was always very engaged and there was always a challenge. Like, um, like the, one of the anecdotes you just brought up about swear words or the amount of blood that could be in a scene and how we'd go further. I mean, with something like that, Tony wasn't particularly interested in gore necessarily, but he knew that that was, like you said, such a hot button topic with the censors that, you know, I mean, for him in that instance, like this first kind of director's cut, if you will, of a scene that was uh, just so gore soaked that it would be impossible to air ever. Um, just the fact that a bunch of S and P suits had to, you know, have that conversation about, you know, that or anal felching or, you know, oral sex. I, he just loved that there were these people somewhere in a boardroom, these very prim proper people that had to be discussing this and like, you know, mentioning time codes and all of these, these quotes. And even if that was never going to make it to air, just that was, um, you know, very engaging for him. There was never any phoning it in. Um, you know, good times, bad times. It was always very, there's a lot of emotion and passion and everything. Um, so, yeah, I guess, I don't know if that answers your question. It does, and more, and more. Um, as we wrap up the conversation, I, I, I like to end with this question. And, and I'm curious about you. For you, with all of the experiences you've had, with all of the work you've done, with this, with this remarkable book, and with everything that you have ahead of you to still do, for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? What does it all come down to? I don't know. I've, I've recently been enjoying some very sort of uh, simple pleasures that I kind of feel like I've missed out on for, for quite a few years. I had the most amazing peach of my life this summer. It was, I, I, th I don't know what it was. I have this complicated relationship with food because of the job so many years, like the food being the object and food so hard to work with and weird things and gross things and seeing how the sausage is made and all that sort of stuff. So I, I feel like I'd kind of forgotten over the years just how sort of magical food could be. And this summer, I just had this, this peach that, I don't know, just, it blew my mind. And it was just the most wonderful, simple thing. Um, and it was great. I've, I feel like I've got to ask the question that is way too on the nose, but did this whole experience just really fuck you up? Totally. Yeah? Totally. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all parts of it. You're not a good normal shoot. Some of the things, you know, that would happen, like the wealth and sort of privilege inequities really sort of mess with your head. Like when, you know, you're filming all day in the favelas and then you go back to this nice hotel room sort of seeing human suffering good things bad things whatever is like not really as human but is this thing to be consumed by a camera to then be commodified and all that, and it's weird it kind of takes humanity away from the people involved and then just getting ready to leave for india when you know the news came that tony had died that still kind of unreal all these years later. But, you know, writing the book was was very helpful for me to process a lot of that stuff. Like I, it had been kind of this this crazy 16 year run and I hadn't really had time to stop and sit down and process it because it was all just, you know, happening so fast. You don't really think about it. I've got to work through a few of those things, but definitely my nerves are still a bit shot. Like if I hear a loud noise, I'll I'll jump a bit quicker, I'm sure, than I would have back in the day. Still wouldn't wish to go back to being that person I was beforehand and kind of like lose all of these things that I've gained as painful as some of them could be because it sort of makes you who you are. And I'm sure I'm a stronger person on the other side of surviving all of this insanity. But yeah, it definitely does f you up. I think that no one understands when they talk about what a great job that was or how much they'd like a job like that. You don't really understand what it might do to you but i mean i think any job kind of f you up none of us should have to work that would be nice but boredom probably f you up a lot too